Hi everyone, I hope you can hear me well. If not, please uh, write a message to a chat so I'll be able to adjust the microphone. And also please don't turn yourself on if you don't feel that you need to do it. Okay, very good, Dmitry. And I think that I will share a presentation and in one or two minutes we will start. So you'll be able to wait for some people that will join a bit later. And also I will have some time to share the screen and I hope the screen is also okay. And so we are kind of ready to start. Maybe, okay, I think that we will finish the part about the formal definition of what the course is and what is the assignment. And then maybe you will have some questions so we can discuss what are sufficient to finish the course and maybe it's kind of different from what you can expect that we don't have this proper homeworks as usual, rather we focus on quizzes and projects. And I hope that this will be better but I can answer questions on it. So I will be happy to answer these questions. Okay, so let's finish this zero introduction and start the actual introduction to all the participants of the course. So it's uh, 27 of November and we start our course on how can we model the clinical data. In particular, we will focus on how can we, okay, I will mute everyone except me. Mm -hmm. okay, very good. And so mm, the idea of the course is to give the current state of the art of what can we do with sequential data and what is different from the data we usually encounter, like images or tabular data. And so in particular, mostly we'll consider deep learning models on neural networks because they, in most areas, are state of art, but sometimes we refer to the more classic models, but it's what would be very often. And so, okay, what I'm talking about when I talk about V. So I'm the lecturer, Alexei Zaisev. I'm an assistant professor at Scoltech, PhD in MES and all the stuff. And uh, I have a beautiful TA, Rodrigo Rivera. He's also in the chat. And he is a PhD student here in Scoltech right now. And also another important part of this course. Uh, and he will, okay, he will introduce himself uh, at a seminar, I hope so, or at the end of the lecture. So, okay, I think it would be better if he doesn't object it. And so also we have uh, our bright students, master students. Uh, this course actually is focused on second year master students, and we assume that you know something about machine learning, deep learning, you can program in PyTorch and all the stuff. So it's what we expect, but I understand if you have little background, it's also possible to dive in, but it means that you will have to put more efforts into completing assignments and final project uh, because something would be like, assume that you are kind of familiar with neural networks and machine learning in general, but don't worry too much. I hope we'll have time and uh, okay, have a right pace to cover all we need. So I hope that you'll be happy with the outcome. And so let's start with the formal definition of what it is to finish this particular course. So it's a free credit course and we have two lectures in a week like this one and another one on Friday from half past 12 and in two is three hours. And the first part of the three hours is a lecture by me. It's like one and a half hour, maybe smaller because in online way, I think that we kind of speed up and so we have to delivering uh, uh, same material in a faster pace, May, I hope not in the course of how well do you understand this course. And after this uh, 90 minutes lecture, we have a short break 
and then Rodri will continue with his seminar and the lecture will be like this classic format when I give some slides, maybe I have some questions in between and okay, I welcome questions from you and also sometimes I make stops so you have to think what we already did and do you have questions regarding it. Okay, I have, we already have a first question, but somehow I can't see it. Okay, I'm sorry for um, So there is a question. I didn't understand what you mean by assignments. Will we have homework? I can say about that. Actually, there's a slide that is coming now. Um, yes, yes, yes. So I, I prefer, let, let's go to the slide, then after the slide, we'll discuss if there's still some questions. I understand this is an important question for you, but I hope it, it, it will be more clear but just wait for like a few more minutes. So you have this course in Canvas. You can go by this link and check what this course is about, some syllabus, the topics, and everything that we basically talk about like, in a few minutes and even deeper. Also, we have Zoom link. Okay, if you are here, you know this link. So we just a reminder that it's here too. Uh, we have also an official Telegram channel to communicate to our students because sometimes it's more convenient to use Telegram than to use uh, Canvas. It's harder to communicate, in my opinion. And also we have a beautiful Notion page, uh, which collects basically all the material that we required for the course. And I think, okay, I think I will even show uh, this page, so you, you can see how, how good it is, and that it really represents what this course is about. Just one more minute, please. Okay. So we have it like this. We have links to syllabus, to plan of the lessons, to list of the projects to be discussed later. Some you get up for seminars, lecture materials, and some lecture videos will be available later. And actually, we don't know the gap between the actual video of the lecture and uh, appearance on YouTube. So, okay, I suggest you don't count on it. You will be have you will have it before you have to finish your quiz. Yeah, shed, schedule, and also particular topics that we also cover later, but. Here you also have some links and links to the papers that we will need for seminars. Okay, I hope at a basic level it's clear and so let's cover it to the very end. And so we then will be able to answer all questions we have after this intro. So we have this link and it is the final link I have on the slide. And so let's go to the next one. And the next one is about the assignments. And you can see that uh, it's basically two types of assignments. The first type is the project divided into a number of parts. And another type is quizzes. Quizzes are easier, so I will start from them. So we have like 14 quizzes in total. Each quiz gives you like 3% of the final grade and to finish the quiz, you have like uh, 48 hours after the session. And uh, basically, for example, for the next quiz that will be available shortly after the session, uh, you have a deadline on 23, 59 at 29th of October. So quiz are uh, basically multiple choice questions. Uh, and I suppose they are not that hard uh, just to check that you understand the lecture and uh, to give you an opinion to go through the slides one more time. We also have another type of assignments that also contribute greatly to the final score, this team project. Uh, team project is what you are doing in a team of like three, four, five people. We will give exact specification a bit later. And uh, we, for you to be, okay, to get better to the end of the course, we split all reports of the, on this project 
into a number of parts. So we have like three preliminary reports, like 12th of November, 26th of November, 10th of November. And we have some points for each of these reports. Also, after completing the project, you record a video. You have another 10% for this video. And also you have uh, this, this final report and source code that you have to submit to complete the course and to have another 20% of your grade. So, or if you sum up all these guys, you have 100% in the end. Uh, regarding what kind of things we expect in each part of your assignment. On the first report, it's like one or two pages. You select the project, or specifically we select the project topic for you. So you describe the problem statement, the main challenges, and you see them and the role for the participants of this project. Because you have a team and maybe it's a good thing to distribute the, what each of you is doing for this project. After uh, like some days, you present another report. It consists of what you have like in first report. And also you have state of the art overview on the topic you are going to challenge in this project. And also some plan on how to go through this project and what you will have in the end. And also what's important, what kind of data you are expected. Mm, you can try, but uh, okay, most of the cases, okay. It's not like 100% probability that you will accept this project topic, actually. So, okay. I think um, you can contact Rodrigo and uh, uh, describe the project topic you want to do in this project. Um, and then you can see if he's okay with this topic or not. <laughs> I, I also want to add some words about this. Yeah, the sure, reports. Yeah. Uh, so, not only you have to submit your status reports, where as Alexei is describing, it is a specific content, but also part of your responsibilities as a team is to give feedback to other teams. So each team will be reviewing two other projects. They will be looking at the reports and then providing hints, things that they could improve and so on. The idea this way is that the whole class is aware of what is happening, but also you can get ideas on which techniques your classmates are using, maybe some interesting uh, approach they're following and so on, that can also help you improve your own project. Actually, you will be distributed into your projects and send periodically for the comment on what, what else uh, should, 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 you be, should you do. Uh, and it's important here yes, that we have like this peer reviewing of your colleagues' projects. Uh, to further deepen what, what understanding of what kind of projects in sequential data processing is possible right now. Okay, so let's let's not rush until the very end. And okay, in the final report we have like this requirement for the volume. I think it's very light. And uh, like, what's more important is that you provide a result of the experiments some conclusions on this project and a link to GitHub repo. Okay, Margaret, we already answered this question one time, but okay, you can write Rodrigo the possible topic, but it is not like 100% probability that we will accept this topic. Yeah, no guarantee. If you find that this is relevant to our project, uh, that we will be happy to accept, but... Okay, so, so let's see. But, and so in the final report, you have also a video, a video that you record with your teammates, you present the results of the project and uh, as Rodrigo already told, for all these activities, there will be also an obligatory check on other people's projects. So, okay, we will describe more details later, but I hope that this give you the basic overview of what we expect from you. And uh, moving from 
reports and quizzes to deadlines, we have a this kind of sync for the report. All the lines are strict. If you like like one or two minutes, it's okay, in my opinion. But if you like um, three hours late, it's too much. We don't accept the support and you go to the next report and you lose the part of the grade that is connected to this particular report. Also for quizzes, we have like this uh, 48 hours to complete the quiz. After a session, like for example, here we have a session at, that ends at uh, like in three hours from four to 16 to 19. And we have like uh, 27 of October. And we have the final deadline as uh, 23.59 on 29th of October. So I think it should be enough. The quizzes, they are not that hard. Most of the questions are something you answer by watching the slides of the lecture. But if you have some urgent need, you can send a regular message and postpone the Levant deadline for three days. So it's like you have like an emergency issue and you can do it in two days. So in this case, you have this option here. I hope it's clear. About the specific topics, as you can see, we cover most of the modern approaches to sequential data modeling, if you're talking about neural networks, and also some specific problem statements and some aspects on what we can do with these models. And in particular, we, I would like to emphasize this other several talks on sequential data models and anomaly detection, which an interesting separate topics or that is different from other models in a way and in terms of metrics and in terms of problems we are trying to solve of a cluster if I suppose important and in general unsupervised approaches to classification data modeling is also can be of great interest to you. And so yeah, it is the last slide on this intro on what you should do at the end of the course. So I welcome questions from you, if you have any. If you think that everything is clear, just write plus sign in the chat. If no, please write your question. Mm, we distribute the topics project. Uh, so you, okay, yeah, Rodrigo is right. Yes, I, I was saying that, I was just saying that we will distribute the, the topics from, we'll provide a list of topics and we'll distribute them among the team members, among the different teams. We'll also assign um, individuals to uh, uh, the team uh, randomly. And the other thing on the team size, this will vary a bit because now we have, for example, here uh, about 31 participants in the class. But of course, not everyone stays registered. Some people drop the course. So uh, this will vary. But at the current size of our class, probably we can be looking at about four to five team members, eventually a bit less, three to four, in case that uh, many people, for some strange reason, decide to drop this class. Okay, any more questions? Mm, yes, Lilia, we will have some kind of requirements for the reports. Uh, some very basic one you can see as a slide, but we'll have more details. Also, Lilia, once we approach, uh, so uh, once we release a list of topics with teammates and so on, we'll provide a more uh, a detailed document where it is clear what are the requirements, what do you need to do, and so on, in order to get a certain uh, grade. For those who took uh, the uh, class of machine learning with Professor Gurnaev um, earlier, late last year actually, 
uh, where we had also their projects, the way how they will be evaluated will be, they will, have, they will have similarities. So you will know how many points you get for each specific deliverable and task. But you will know all this in detail in later this week, at the beginning of next week. Uh, about uh, postpone of the deadline, I think maybe we will, okay. Uh, does anyone else, apart from Vitaly, has problems with enrollment in this class right now? Or everyone else who wanted to? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think we can postpone the deadline or one more day, and I hope by Friday you should solve all the issues with education and so you will have time to complete the quiz. Mm, have to be assigned to the same team as a classmate of mine. A question from Mark. Mm, I think you can try and we will try to fit you in this team, but okay. It's not guaranteed. We will try. Okay, I hope that no questions here, no more questions. And we can move to the part when we actually do some science and some teaching. And so let's start from the very basic questions. Why do we ever need this separate part of science? Why don't we need some like usual? No, Ilya, we have only two types of assignments. This all type, all assignments are listed at this side. The first part of the assignment is project and some in between reports on the project. And the second types of assignment is quizzes that will be available in 48 hours after each session. So there is no more programming task apart from what we are doing in your project. In your project, you for sure would do some coding, but it's not like we check it's too in depth, just because in this case, it's like a second year master students and PhD level course and we expect that you already know how to code something. But what we want to teach you is how to get use of some particular models. So we check this particular learning outcome in this course. So we check what you are doing in your projects. And also check that you are doing it right, not only in terms of code, but only in the results you get and how you interpret, it, interpret this particular results. Okay, so let's go on. And now we are talking about these particular models. So we start with the very basic examples. So we have a ball, and this ball, ball it has some position, uh, has some position at uh, time moment t capital. And our problem, not specific machine learning problem, but a general problem, is to predict the position of a ball at a time t plus one. Here or here or here, we don't know. And if we know nothing about the position of the ball, it's, it's just impossible to predict what is going to be, what's the state, what's the position of the ball as an extent. It's just like equal probability to go at any direction. We have not enough information to solve this particular problem. But if we observe the history uh, for the particular ball, we can somehow predict the future. From the past, we can collect these positions at time t minus two, t minus one, and t, collect all of them, and try to guess what would be the position at time t plus one. In this case, as we observe some dynamics, we know that this position, this high probability would be something like this. So in this case, we need to we post a separate problems 
and we need to process the data we have on this particular bone. And it can be very diverse what kind of information we can get from the past. And it can be not very well structured. But let's start from a very simple case. And for some problems. Maybe if you imagine some kind of time series process task, you can imagine that you try to predict time series. So you know or retail good sales and time on G and what you want to do, you want to continue this time series and have this prediction something like this. And so in this case you have the input as what you have in the past, maybe for this good, maybe for other goods as well. And you want to combine all of them as input to our database model and provide as an output of our machine learning model a sales next week. So our model work in this way and you can apply this scenario in many different applied problems. For example, you can try to predict stock prices, maybe something you think about when you're talking about time series. Maybe not very good actually problem to, to solve because many people try to solve it and this is the reason why it's so hard to get something that you can use to, to be richer after application of this model. But okay, this, as an example, I think it's a good one. So you have stock prices for one company, for another company, and again, you try to combine all your knowledge, put into some black box machine learning model, and output the prediction what you, we will observe in the next day, in next minute, or predict maybe volatility or volatility of this prediction. So how, in what range would lie our prediction and our prices as well. Uh, we can move to slightly more complex input data. For example, we can information from SMS messages, instant messages we have on our phone from visits to different, uh, from different shops. And we want to see if this particular sequence of transactions uh, is a fraud. Is this something that is not usual, but this anomaly for a particular user of this credit card. In this case, we can block it. And so it would be beneficial for a customer and for a bank. We can move to even more complex problems. with a more complex input and more complex output data. And in this case, we can, for example, look at speech recognition when we have this time series as input and we want to transform it to text we can work with. Another example is, okay, in this case, you see that we change the type of the output. We no longer predict something that is of fixed length because the number of words in this speech can be very different, can vary from one to 1,000 and we should be able to provide the correct output in all these cases. But we can go back to a more traditional machine learning problems. For example, we have a text and we want to predict the ranking or the score of the movie provided by a customer. One star or five stars and so on. We can imagine that we use machine learning to see DNAs to do a translation or to see what's happening on the video. And in this case, maybe it's not understandable why, why should we do it, what is the profit of this model. But you can, for example, watch uh, some workers that are working at a power plant or an oil station and check if they are wearing a cask or another protective equipment. Or do they wear a mask when they are moving in a shop in these hard times we are having due to COVID. So we have a lot of input data, possible input star machine learning, a lot of possible output star machine learning. And so in this all cases, we see that there is some difference between what kind of input data we have. So we see there's a lot of problems and some of them are important. And also we see that input data can be very different. So let's start from the very basic case when we have structured data. And in this case, we can imagine our data as a big table 
which we input to our model for to learn something from this data. Okay, so we start from this time series prediction problem. And as input, as I already said, we have history until this particular time moment. This is input. As an output, we want to predict something at this time moment. For example, we can say that we want to predict this particular next point, as, and it can be for sure beneficial. And what we can do to do this kind of prediction? We can try to formalize this problem as a classic machine learning problem. We say that this is our history, history, and this is what we have at this particular moment. So this is present. And we then want to predict something. So we have this table as input data and one number as an output. So in this case, we can just try to uh, give, uh, to produce a description of an input and an output. So we can, for example, say this, this is our input and this is our output. And we have for each object uh, a description here and an output. The encryption can be a fixed size vector. So we just put all we have here and uh, like reshape it to be not a matrix or a part of a matrix, but to be a vector. So we have now a list of features here. Maybe we uh, even add something to the end of this vector. This is a list of features. And this is our output. And we can imagine that we not only add previous values of what we want to predict. For example, we want to predict number of customers that go to a store during the next day. But also use some other features like sales, like weather here, or maybe some categorical features like JF Week or some derivative features like the difference between the number of visitors in this day and in previous day. And all these features are legit as well as we can know this information beforehand. And it can be some interesting cases. For example, we want to predict number of customers and we can use prediction with, with, a, with a prediction for this particular day. And so we apply some kind of AP from, for example, Yandex weather or Gizmetia. And uh, it puts information into all the features and we use this prediction from other model, maybe very complex model, to improve our particular model. So in the end, we have something that are very familiar to us. If you write down not for one object, this list of features, but for many objects, you can imagine that you have like this tabular data for machine learning. So we can apply any methods you know. As well as we have this representation as a long vector of features. For example, we can train uh, like gradient boosting approach to predict output from the input. And any other method you can imagine. So in this case, it seems like a very simple, but very effective solution if we know what kind of features we want to work with. And the most important part is not the approach. I think that most of the time, in this case, it would be gradient boosting or maybe linear regression based on previous features, which often called just after regression. But the quality of model will depend on features you select. And if you are happy enough to have a lot of good features, then you already solved the problem. And it seems like we don't need to do something more complicated. Uh, when you're doing like some uh, specific industrial process, it's important to know that uh, most of the time you need to adapt your cross-validation scheme 
for estimation of the quality of this model. So for example, if you have some time of sales of oranges, uh, then in this case, you need to split the data to this in this particular way. So you, when you use cross-validation, you start with uh, the part that is uh, like, like this part is for training, this for tests, then we move forward and forward and we have a like, different splits and we never use data from the future uh, when we are concerned about this particular test data. Okay, seems pretty easy. And also it's important to take into account that it's very useful to have some baselines as in many other machine problems. And in this particular problem, it's often it's very easy to get good baselines without any machine learning. For example, so you can predict uh, using the last known values. In this case, our prediction looks like this. No, not very good, not very bad prediction, but it's, 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 it's enough. Not good, not bad, but a good thing to compare to. Also, you can see that, say that you have this feature, this feature, this feature as input, and we try to construct a linear model like W1, Y3 minus 1, W2, Y3 minus 2, and so on. And this is our prediction for the target value as the next time step, and it's quite easy to construct such model. And it can be very effective and also because of the nature of the data because it's very natural to have this weighted sum of previous values when you predict something in the future. And it's pretty natural that this is a linear correspondence between the sales in the past and what you have later. And as you can see from the right plot, these two models are very good. In particular, we, if you predict our sales for this problem and we do the correct cross-validation, then we have like very good R squared values, very close to one, and kind of very good correspondence when you compare two values and predictions. So in this particular case, you have like exact prediction when you compare to the true value. Uh, when you are talking about a specific metric mm, for their series prediction, you can use standard S squared. And also, it's very popular to measure map time measure. It's mean absolute percentage error. Okay, so let's have a first question to the audience. Do you know what is map time? If you don't know, please write a minus sign. If you know, can you please share a formula in chat? for your colleagues. Okay. Does anyone know? Okay. Yeah, Alexandra, you are right that we can search in Wikipedia for this particular metric. But let's describe it, okay, just write down a formula. So you have uh, your actual values. G from some period of time. You have your predictions from your model. These are these real values. Uh, you are almost right, but, but, but not. 100%. Yes, more absolute value will be better. Real values. And we have our predictions. And in this case, we say that our map value is the sum of the absolute differences between true values and predictions divided by the absolute value of the true value and we use the mean value of these guys. So we measure this relative difference between y and y with a head. So that's it. So when we have Maya, we just don't have this term in the denominator. 
but otherwise it's easy to it's easy to compute map pair and it can be pretty useful and it's kind of relative measure and you can say what's the mean percentage error and you can say that it's easier to interpret sometimes you don't need to look as the absolute values to understand if your predictions are good or bad but also it's subject to normalization if you want to normalize your outputs then you are no longer have a very bad estimation so let's go on so we covered the part when we want to do the serious prediction with some kind of machine learning quite popular problems and uh, most of the time it's quite easy to solve in this course we don't cover like, more sophisticated methods like something like ARIMA, I hope you know something about at least you heard about it, or just uh, or seasonal after regression and moving average ARIMA, and so on. And we don't cover in depth what we want to do when we want not only the prediction, so here we have this yellow prediction, but also if you want to have confidence interval for this prediction uh, but okay maybe if you have some time in the end we will try to cover it uh, but the thing is that it's like something you maybe should know from one side from from other side most of the time you can just use some library and we have even library in python on this topic called start models and if you want to do something like this for the prediction of your time series, you can just look at the documentation of this library and it works pretty good. And we have even more packages if we use R language instead of Python. You can look at it too, as it's actually, you shouldn't be afraid to use R for this particular problem because it's another script language. You can learn it in one two days and proceed with some models you need to for your particular problem. But we have not only structured data. When you say that you have like a large table and you can easily reformulate the problem as a machine learning and you just uh, select the right features, uh, but instead it's sometimes important to proceed semi-structured data this is something you usually do when you are thinking about neural networks so let's cover it in more details uh, just one minute for you to answer a simple question is everything until this particular moment is clear if yes please write a plus sign if no please write a minus sign Mm, maybe also cut. Okay, okay, very good. So let's go. So we want to move to a more sophisticated case, and let's ask provide some motivation of why we should do it. And we, I will give you like a textbook example uh, of what we should do when we want to predict the next word. It does not seem like very applied problems, but it's very close to many problems that are concerned with, with processing of natural language data. So we have this data as input to the left, and we have also the output we want to predict. And so let's try to apply what we have learned, try to give some ideas of what kind of thing we can do if we are in this framework of constructing the features and using it. The first idea. Okay, we should use the past, let's use the previous word or a couple of previous words because we don't want to use the text from the very beginning and very long. It can be unconnected to the words we want to predict. But instead, let's use one or two words. Let's start with just one word, the word just, and use some kind of future representation. In this particular case, let's do it 
as one hotel corner. Because actually we don't have many other options. So we say that we use number of features g equal to the a number of words in the dictionary. You know, for example, in English it would be like something like 100,000 words or something like this. The order of magnitude of the series should be like something like this. And so if we observe this word, we say that for the word, for the column that's related to the feature just, we use one and we have zeros for all other columns. Mm, it's pretty clear that we will be able to do very good prediction in this case. We have too many features and we have too many parameters to learn. And specifically we can't learn long-term dependencies. If we have some sentence, something like this, so Francis, where I grew up, but I now live in Boston, I speak fluent, and it's pretty easy to imagine this is French or maybe English because it's about Boston. But okay, to make this decision, we need this word that is far away. All this word. And in both these cases, we need to kind of enrich our representation with new features. So let's use all the previous words to generate features representation of the past. And so now we have uh, this one for encoding, just we count the number of words that relates to each particular feature. For example, like feature here, it can be feature, I don't know, difficult, and so on. So in this case, we again modify the past to the representation, and we have this bag of words model. So we don't uh, care about the order of the word because we don't know how to incorporate it in our particular model. And so we can try to use the information we have in the past. But okay, maybe it's not something we look like for some examples. The first example can be like this. For example, we want to classify this review of the restaurant. In this case, we can say that maybe it's about some, some good class, good reviews. And in this case, we just change the order. And right now, for this problem, we have another class. So bad review, the food is bad. And so it seems like we need to take information, to take into account information about the third order. And this bag of third maybe is too weak to give us a general good solution. So to put a long story short, we have considered this long term memory requirement, this order information that we need to do. Also, what we can observe from these examples of processing of uh, texts and other semi-structured data is that sometimes, often, we want this kind of natural processing because when we, for example, want to construct bag of words, it's actually a lot of tricks to do it better. For example, we remove stop words that actually don't improve our knowledge about the past, for example, the word he or the word and, it add nothing to, to the meaning. And we need some kind of preprocessing. We need to remove punctual punctuation signs. Or in some problems we don't need. So it's kind of like a, a science on how can we preprocess the data. Again, another problem is that uh, these sequences we want to work with are variable lengths. It's not something that we just fix how far we look at the past and we want to have this particular result. Sometimes we need the variable length sequence as an input and as an output. For example, we want to translate from one language to another. We don't know the length of a sentence for the first for the first sequence, and in a similar way, we don't know the result is the length of the output of our model. 
And so if you look at one who's encoding, it's kind of solve this problem and maybe this problem. But uh, maybe a better solution would be something that can learn representations, some kind of recurrent methods. And we will see later if it is the case or not. So to, we have kind of this answer to the questions about this classic ML models and this bag of words, or other ways to generate features from text or from other weekly structure input. But it seems that we need something more complex. And uh, we have another motivation of why this work, because well, why should we should try it, because it works for many areas when we need to learn very complex uh, behavior, very complex features. How, in this case, you want to extract features that are relevant to the elephant, and this is what we are doing with the neural network, and we can even improve over the quality of the human for this particular case. And so this motivation easily transfers to what we are doing with text or with other sequential data. We need to learn features in an automatic way. We need to learn not something that we predefined it to learn, to detect edges or maybe to extract some fully aspect, but okay, it can be used with some problems, but definitely not something we can do for a general problem. Instead of trying to engineer. Mm, okay, Dmitry, the answer is more complex than this. Uh, but when you do a human assessment of this particular problem, then humans uh, do more mistakes than computer. Maybe it can be due to that we have a very large number of classes, and if we, if we have not one class, but we have 1,000 classes, then in this case, it's very hard for human to select the right one. Maybe they just don't care too much about the right answers. They look for something that's more or similar, and happy with it, but machine, okay. Machine got answers for all possible classes and so it's the best one. But uh, basically we can say that in many cases, uh, convolutional neural networks uh, can work at a level that's very close to the level of human. Maybe another example is some kind of medical image process. In this case, we also can train a neural network that work um, in, at, with an accuracy similar to the accuracy of a human doctor. So you need to learn like 10 years to, became, to become a doctor and to have a quality of recognition of some kind of problems with your lungs. Uh, and your model, you train it like two weeks and it can do in a similar way or better. So it can be a more difficult problem in image recognition. But okay, I think that I even have a link here. Yeah, you, you can see, you can follow the link and know the details about what, what is the exact experiment uh, the researchers did to compare the performance of a human and a dependent model. And basically, we just need to learn the representations. We also need a lot of other things, but we don't care too much in this course. It's not about mass, it's about that we have big data. Uh, but basically, all these approaches will work if we have the semi structured data and we don't know how exactly to extract features from audio signal, from texts, from videos. And so, so this kind of problems is motivation to use neural networks instead of algorithms that just use the uh, complete set of features that we can imagine. Of. Another example is more on the side of the motivation and on the beauty of the work of neural network. You can say that it's pretty easy to train a neural network to generate a text that looks very close to nature. And we can do it 
with even models from a previous generation. It's a long, short term memory um, architecture of a neural network. We can generate this kind of complex texts text on algebraic geometries. It's quite easy to learn the model and to apply them, and it works like a charm. And we will see later why this works. So, to the end, we have a lot of challenges what we want to solve and what we want to deal with when we are talking about some structural data. And an answer to many of the challenges is how can we learn proper representations via neural networks. And what we can see at the moment is even for relatively simple models, our results would be great and much better than if we apply some models that are not very good about this kind of sequential data. For example, natural language or audio or videos. We also consider another important application, maybe it's one of the most important applications you can think about when you are thinking about natural language processing. Uh, we will consider machine translation. How can we translate a text from one language to another? So we have a sequence of tokens in one language and we want to output a sequence of tokens in another language and we want to be in, in the most efficient way. In this lecture we will cover only very basic, very basic things, very br brief coverage of the history of what, uh, what people try to do to solve this problem. Maybe later we will dive deeper and consider more of the metrics. So actually, the, okay, the general artificial intelligence and the interest of, of what artificial intelligence can do and cannot do, it's not new. And even in 1950s, there was a lot of talking about that we will construct artificial intelligence in two weeks and it will beat human in all problems like chess, go, machine translation. And uh, we can see that researchers back then uh, think that uh, for machine translation, we also can provide a good solution. But when you look closer, it's not something we would expect that we would. It actually uh, was a rule-based approach that use just English Russian diction, dictionary and to translate from English to Russian or from Russian to English, you just look the words in the dictionary and look for its translation. So it was not something that I would like to say that it's an artificial intelligence, uh, but rather some very primitive rule-based system. It's no surprise that um, in five years it was shut down because they have no significant there is well, a lot of similar approaches this time and uh, the idea was to construct the formal model of the language and if you have this formal model we can do a translation using like the, for the formula how to translate each particular sentence. But as far as I know the system was very complex and they don't provide very good quality of translation and of understanding of the going on inside the text. Instead, a new approach was proposed based on, statist on statistics, on the features, on what something we can consider as this bag of words with steroids, with some additional features to, to work on. It was a very complicated and very heavy model. It took like a week's or years of work to complete this kind of model. And these models have very large number of components, very large and very complex processing of the data. And you need, you are in constant need to support such a system. And you can imagine that you can just put a, push a button and retrain the model from scratch if you put new data to it you should like manually describe new scenarios, carefully craft the input for these models. For example, okay. Uh, 
And this is, uh, was really a terrible idea to, to construct such systems, very expensive idea, but it worked better than the basic models. And uh, I suppose that some of you can remember the quality of Google Translate before 2014. It was not very good. And when you go back in the past, like in 2006 or something like this, the quality was terrible despite many efforts and many resources devoted to this particular problem. But that's another area. There were uh, there was a deep learning revolution in like 2014. In this year, there was proposed a neural network architecture that can work with machine translation. The idea is the following. We have two neural networks. The one neural network inputs and has an input sequence as an input. So it's kind of encoder. We have an embedding that belongs to some uh, space okay, of size E. Then we decode this embedding uh, to have an output sequence in another language. We will cover later what kind of neural networks we have here as an encoder and another one as a decoder. But the quality of this solution was very good and at least it was better than the quality of the method of the previous generation and it took like one, two months to train this model, including the time devoted to engineering on what should be done, on what on the programming and all the stuff and just write the right model and it works like a child. For sure there were some challenges unsolved because we now have a black box or something that Mm, no, not that very complex system. For example, we have something like this. When we want to translate paper jam, that's more something like this. We get something like this. It's more like a jam of paper. No, definitely, uh, the algorithm doesn't understand what's going on. Another problem is that we have little control, and we see that uh, if you have a different problem, it inherits biases from the training sample. For example, we have these two <clears throat> sentences from Malay language. And uh, as you can see, if you know Malay, but if you don't know, you can see that this, all these parts are similar except this last one that denotes a profession. Now, when we translate, we see that here we have a translation that she works as a nurse. And for the second sentence, he works as a problem. So somehow we direct the gender on the basis of what we already have. And the problem was that we have little problem over it. Control. Another example of what we have, what we can have if we have very small amount of data is this example. If you have only corpus of texts devoted to religion, Maybe it is the case when we have Somali English translation because I suppose the Bible is translated to almost all languages. Then we tend to translate all text as uh, Bible texts. And we input some garbage here and we have some religious stuff to the right. Okay. So we have a lot of strange results. We have little control over them. The overall quality was not very good. But the thing is that uh, despite in the, the diff, there was a difference between natural language processing and uh, sequence, sequential data processing in general and convolutional neural networks and computer vision. Computer vision, they were uh, convolutional neural networks. They work well and uh, they have no new architectures that can provide similar state of the art. Uh, but in natural language processing, we have steady progress and we have like, another model that can work even better at the name of this another model in transformer. When you compare the blue scores, we want to maximize the blue score if you want a better translation. 
Then we see that transformer for post ISO post in 2018 is even better. In this case, you see that a significant gain over recurrent neural networks used previously to solve this particular problem. So now this is the best model, and we can see that uh, all, almost all the talks during the recent years in this area are about transformer. And we can say that the transformer is very close in quality to human translation. There are some limitations in this paper. So this is a paper published in September 2020 in Nature Communications. And it's about uh, a designing a deep learning system to translate from I suppose Slovenian to English or vice versa. And this is this qubit model to for translation of the English. And you can see that the quality judged by human experts and non-experts are comparable. For example, you can see that uh, the uh, median, va me median value for the overall quality is greater for qubit than for reference human translation. And you can see that on the base of other metrics, the quality of these translations are very close to each other. So we now can say that we are quite close to the solution of this problem too, using neural networks. Now we can almost beat humans. And uh, uh, I can see that even Google Translate can do quite a great job when compared to some of people around you. It selects the good words, it provides reasonable quality. Sometimes it fails, but it's a very good starting point to translate something. And so, you can see that right now, for this particular problem, maybe the most important problem in natural language processing, we see a very good progress over the last years. And this progress, progress is due to neural networks and due to learning representations of the data. And we can see that the quality of the final solution is very close to the quality of translation by humans. So let's look at the very basic model for this the processing of the creational data. And I think that we will end the lecture by considering this model to have something for the next one. In particular, we will consider vanilla recurrent neural network, something that we will not, will not have long memory spoiler. So what we, how can we imagine about construction a uh, neural network model crossing of sequential data? We can say that we have each time moment, we have time moment time, t minus one, t minus, or t minus two, t minus one, t. We have input vector, for example, it can be a finite vector or a word. We have hidden state from the past and we have output, something that we want to predict. And so what we are doing in this model, we say that we have this black box and this black box takes hidden state from the previous timestamp and input vector and outputs new hidden states and output some prediction. And this hidden state contains all the information we need for prediction. So a very, very natural model. In this case, we can hope that if we have a good enough black box, then we can pass information through this hidden state or cell state to, okay, arbitrary large lengths, lengths in the future and use it for prediction. And so we have a uh, little concern about long-term memory and pretty simple scheme to apply this problem. So if you want to train this model, we just use the derivatives that we pass in a back propagation way, similar to what we have in full connected or convolutional neural networks. And so by taking the derivatives with respect to the input, we can say what is good and what is bad, and how this black box should look like. 
And as you expect that we, it's basically a very similar process. We expect that this black box is similar. And so what we left, we just estimate parameters of this black box by some cross function. And let's consider some particular examples on how this black box looks like. In particular, we consider recurrent neural network, a single block from what we saw at previous slide. We say that it, to produce the next hidden state, we should use the new features at time t and a previous hidden state. And an example can be something like this. We have a linear transformation here for inputs, linear transformation for hidden states, some bias, and hyperbolic tangents to get the new hidden state. To get a prediction, we apply some function of this hidden state. It can be, for example, a softmax if we solve a classification problem. And inside a softmax, we have a linear transformation of ash and some bias, bias added. So this is basically this recurrent neural network block. With this particular activation functions, and with these links between these four guys. So it's quite clear that we can uh, move the information from the particular, for each particular timestamp to a very large parallel in the future. We just see that we, for h t plus one, get the similar formula, x t plus one and h t, and h t depends on previous x, and on previous ash, so we say that each ash depends on all previous hidden states, and so on all previous axes. And so when we make a decision that's based on the current value of the hidden state, we again can use information from the very, very far away things, events in the past. So we can be pretty happy about it. But it turns out that it doesn't work like a chair. And actually, we can maintain all the information. We have natural generation features. We have processing of very, of like nature, any sequence of elements. But we actually don't have a memory. Because uh, from experiments, we can see that we just can learn this long-term dependency because we have draw a very long way to get these derivatives and so there is very little dependence due to numerical things and we will consider later well, and so on and so unfortunately this this is not enough and we will need more things to work with in this case Mm, okay, I hope this message is clear. Another message is that we have a similar semi structure information from other problems, but I hope that we already discussed it. So, what we can say in general about this topic? We can say that this is an important topic with many applied problems we want to solve. And for some problems, it's enough to use you know, machine learning and gradient boosting if we know how to generate features for this particular problems. But if we go and try to use uh, semi-structured data as input, that we are forced to use neural networks based models. It can be um, quite kind of hard to propose a good model. And this vanilla recurrent neural network is not enough. Mm, I think that we, yeah, we will cover this later when we go to transformer part. When we have some time to dedicate to discuss transformers in depth, uh, both architecture and performance for some particular problems. Mm, but I think the short answer is if you get all things right, then we will have similar performance. Uh, but the problem is kind of 
mm, take more takes more time to use transformers like any other neural network model and it's better and faster model if you use just classic machine learning approaches in this case so going back to we, I'm happy that we started this course. I uh, would be happy to uh, tell you about some very nice and good architectures, especially and because these innovations and these new models are pretty recent, proposed in kind of uh, like recent years. And I will be happy to share this topic with you, both in terms of application side when we're trying to solve applied problems with different architectures. And on the side that we propose kind of new models and new understanding of the world and around us. Unfortunately, there would be not very much explanation on why some models work and why some models don't for this particular problem. But it's something that we don't know even for convolutional neural networks. And I hope that after some years in this course, we will also, also talk about uh, the kind of fundamental theory, but not yet. So thank you for your attention. I think we can have like uh, three, five minutes uh, questions and answers session and then go to a break. Do you have any questions? Okay, uh, so another question, not from you to me, but from me to you. Uh, can you see if this class is um, harder than you think or easier? And you can, can write it in chat and say that if it's harder, it would be like five points and it's very easy and you already know anything. And then it would be one. Yes, we want to cover not only NLP applications here, Okay. Mm, not, not, oh, okay. Uh, actually, it's a misprint and the right word in here, not all problems are NLP. No, it's right. Thank you for pointing this out. Uh, Alexey, I'm sorry, I missed the first part of the lecture. Uh, yeah. Will we have a special like uh, section devoted to time series? Mm, uh, are you talking about something like ARIMA or this kind of methods? Uh, no, I mean uh, using uh, recurrent neural networks for time series uh, prediction. We will try to, to cover it, yes. yes. Okay, and see what we can do right now about application of these methods. Yes. Okay. So it would be not only NLP applications. We will consider examples of semi-structured data that are not NLP. And also I hope that we will cover also general time series prediction, but from neural network point of view. I'm sorry, did I get it right that uh, neural networks are not so popular for time series prediction? And uh, usually we can use uh, like uh, simpler models like ARIMA or something else. No, I would not say that ARIMA is a very simple model. But uh, in many cases, it's enough to use machi uh, classic machine learning for the particular, yes, the particular problems. Uh, I think that the main motivation why we should use neural networks if we have uh, like complex data, we can extract features in an automatic way. If, if it is not the case, it would be harder to, to, okay, to say that neural networks would be better. I will say it depends a lot on the problem. For example, in time series problems, often it is the case that the data set has, let's say, five, 50 time series, each of them with 20 observations. Then for those type of data, 
one cannot, of course, use a neural network. It doesn't make sense at all. So if you have, for example, let's say web data or financial time series data, or this can be millions of observations over long time periods, then yes, it becomes much more attractive to use neural networks. And as Alexei mentioned, one of the interesting things of working with neural networks for time series forecasting is that we can create, for example, embeddings using, let's say, events, uh, the, the date, uh, also certain things related to actual information that we know about these data and so on. So this allows for much more flexibility that is not possible in something such as Arima, but depends a lot on your data. Uh, okay, so uh, we can use uh, neural networks if we have a large data set or for, uh, for embeddings, two, two types of application. Yes, but also as we'll see in uh, so future, future lessons when we discuss uh, so the transformer architecture and attention mechanism. In general, with traditional neural architectures as well with, with ARIMA and other classic methods for time series modeling, there is a limitation that uh, they do not look into the full history of the data. And there are many applications where it takes a lot of time to really assess um, so the impact of, of a decision. So for example, let's say if, uh, so talking about the example of the stock market, it takes for some stocks some time to really see if you will have a profit there. And these classic methods, as well as traditional uh, neural network architectures, they cannot capture this because the, uh, the event was too far too into the past. So here again, uh, one is to use, for example, the transformer architecture. Okay, so we will have it in future in more details, uh, right? Uh, yes, all that will be discussed in more details in the future. Okay, that's very interesting. I hope so. <laughs> Mm, about pattern recognition, mm, yes, yes. Rodrigo is asking the right question. What you are talking about when you are talking about a pattern recognition? If it is processing of images or sequences of images, mm, I think we don't cover it too much. Uh, we don't consider video processing mostly. Maybe, maybe if some one or two cases, but not like the what significant part of the course to uh, yeah to work in these images or by pattern recognition do you mean for example the classifier or convolutional neural networks because okay operation recognition so why is operation recognition margaret i think maybe it's some like when someone is trying to yes something like that. Mm. Ah, I, I, um, so one of the topics I will discuss in, in the seminars is the topic of um, so temporal point processes. And this is potentially connected to what you mean in that. Uh, so we can observe time series that are connected to some activity. For example, uh, let's say that, um, so human movement. So I can be standing, I can be sitting, I can be sleeping, or I can be walking and running. And I can for this have, let's say, a time series that has a, the epidometer. And how can I know, so what is happening at, at this time? So for example, if the, my epidometer marks zero, is it because I am standing, I am sitting, or I am sleeping? These type of problems can be solved with, for example, temporal point processes, so event sequences that we'll look later. Um, and this can be connected to what you're mentioning with drilling data, but I'm not sure if this is really what you mean or you mean something else. Great. Okay, any more questions? Hmm, I think if not, we can have a tea break for like 10 minutes and then Rodrigo will continue with the seminar. All right, so then let's reconvene at 5.35, so 10 minutes from now, and we'll have our first seminar.